read. There are plenty of good papers. The only problem with archive is that you wouldn't know a priori how good the paper is until you read the paper because archives are not peer reviewed papers. Okay. All right. But generally, since it is managed by Stanford and Harvard jointly, they do have some measure of quality. I think somebody has a question or wants to ask a question. Sir, sir, that's me, uh, Balachandra. Yes. Sir, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Sir, I was, no, no, I was, no, just reading, I was reading through and I was uh, uh, very impressed by the exponential um, averaging. Uh, I just wanted to know if you have worked on that. So I needed some support in exponential uh, smoothing and exponential average. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, you see the bullet point number two, yeah? Okay. <laughs> yes, sir, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll come to that in a moment. But so far, does anybody have any question regarding whatever I had just, I mean, till now spoken? If you do, please raise your hand and ask a question. Otherwise, I'll just move on and I'll respond to Professor Balachandra's question okay all right to answer your question professor i mean this is not really exponential smoothing so if you know what particle swarms are a uh, particle by the way so you actually asked a good good question which actually gives me an opportunity to elaborate this further i mean what do i mean by you know novel contributions in research is that at some point of time, somebody can ask, okay, particle swarm optimization was proposed by Ebenhardt and Lee in 1995. So what are you doing, Snyam Susa? Okay, to that question, my answer is the following, is that yes, particle swarm does this, but then the particle swarm optimization, which is traditionally known as a swarm algorithm, which guides the velocity and position updates for a bunch of particles together. And this bunch of particles could be a flock of fish, they could be a flock of birds, they could be uh, bees, they could be swarms, anything, right? So yes. what really happens in particle swarm is that there is an exploration phase and then there is an exploitation phase, okay? In a vanilla particle swarm optimization algorithm, the exploration and exploration, exploitation phases are given equal importance, okay? And the way, and so there is a personal best that, okay, let me give an example. All right, so we have all grown up, like we were child and children, we used to go to, went to school, we had our neighbors, right? We had our neighbors, we had our neighbor aunties and neighbor uncles, right? Okay, so have you heard the joke, uh, Sharma Ji Ka Beta? How many no, of sir, you have no. heard the joke? Oh, Sharma Ji Ka Beta, okay. So if I may indulge in one or two lines of Hindi, right? Sanjay, can I do that? Yeah. Shouldn't be a problem. Okay. All right. So that joke about, so let's say, let's say me. Okay. Let's say I'm a useless kid and I'm probably in my sixth standard, seventh standard, right? Okay. I'm not doing really well in studies. So my mom comes and tells me, what are you doing? I mean, kya kar rahe ho aap? Oh, dekho Sharma ji ka beta. Look what Sharma ji's daughter or son is doing. They're doing so good. You should really follow her. You should really try to follow what she is doing. Talk to her. Try to get some advice from her, so on and so forth. So what happens really? What really happens is, I mean, your mom is telling you first that you are not good enough. Okay. And then she's expecting that you improve your performance. And that's not it. She's also expecting you improve your performance. And then you do as well as Sharmaji's daughter and son. Okay, so what really, if in, in an algorithmic sense, what is really happening is you want to improve your personal best and then you, you are here, right? And then you suddenly realize, oh, Sharmaji's beta is so far ahead of me. So I have to follow Sharmaji's beta or Sharmaji's daughter, right? So there is a personal best and there is a global best. So the dynamics between the personal best and global best among a bunch of, so remember, if you have a bunch of particles, among the bunch of particles, only one particle has a global best, right? Okay. And then since that person becomes a leader and the rest of the swarm actually follows that particle. And that is how the movement happens. And that is how up to many of the meta heuristic multi-objective optimization problems are solved. So this is as far as vanilla swarm. 
I'm not going to get into the technicalities of it, but in order to answer the question of Professor Balachandra, what I'll say is, so if your exploration and exploitation are equal, then there are some technical hindrances that you encounter, one of them being if you are solving an optimization problem in a classification setup, particularly over deep, deep neural networks, you tend to hit local, local minima, you get stuck in a local minima or you get in a saddle point. Okay, so the vanilla particle swarm algorithm will not be able to, you know, help you much whenever that happens. And whenever that happens, your final aim, which is to minimize the error because you are doing a predictive analytics, takes a serious hit. So what we do or what we had done, and this is in fact, this is in fact a publication in IEEE transactions on emerging topics in uh, computational intelligence just out where we showed that if we average the velocities and use an exponentially weighted history of not only the present velocity, but also all the past velocities with a momentum correction, then this problem of saddles, saddles or local minima can be avoided. Okay. So we not only say that in a hypothesis manner, we also prove it. Okay. We prove it theoretically and empirically. And that is what constitutes the foundation of Ada Swarm. We further take it forward. So this we call is that exponentially weighted momentum particle swarm optimization, which is a variant of the existing particle swarm optimization, but is also able to solve an important problem in deep neural networks, which your traditional particle swarm optimization algorithm is not able to solve. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. So this is yeah. what EMPSO is. I mean, I can I can share that paper with you, Professor, if you are interested. Okay. Sure, sir. Yes. In, yes. Thank you in, so much. In, in, in short, this is what I had to say. Okay. Yes, so anyway, yes. and then there are, and also please understand when I'm telling the committee that I'm going to propose novel activation functions in deep learning, they will ask me what, what is the novelty in that uh, activation function? Right. Okay. So I would actually suggest Archana to because Archana was involved in this work heavily and we had been able to publish two, three very good papers out, I would actually, you know, request Archana to give a talk later on, much later, I mean, internally, so that you know, right, what is what is the novelty in the in such activation functions, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, so the point is, you are actually, how many points do you see here? You see seven points. Each one of them potentially can turn out to be a paper in itself. And in fact, that's what it happened. I mean, all of these seven points that I listed at that point of time turned out to be papers and many more. So it actually turned out to be uh, more than 10 papers, all in very prestigious journals. But at least from each point that we have talked about in 2014, turned out to be a paper. So when you are proposing something, there is also a time component to it, like time sensitivity attached to it. So if you are saying something, the referees must be convinced that this is not only a short term fix, but this particular solution and this particular method can also be extended to other data sets as well. So which brings me back to my earlier assertion when I was criticizing somebody else's work that you pick one data set right and you apply a method and you show that okay this method is working well and is beating all other methods that's not good enough that's not nearly good enough because what happens when it's a different data set that is being thrown at you and you will have to be able to comment on your method so when you present your method there has to be some intuitive explanation of why your method is working on certain data sets and if your method does not work on a particular data set you have to be able to explain why okay. uh, I, so, yes please yeah so i have a small doubt hmm? uh suppose that, like like you mentioned there are seven uh, methods which you which you just have to i think you're breaking yeah. up Ashina. yeah i see is my voice no, I think it's uh, yeah. Go ahead. So what I actually wanted to know: suppose we propose a method, and the method on something and doesn't the data set. Is it mm -hmm. okay to show in a paper that this yes, particular yes, yes. Least, method doesn't at least work? Be able to yes. At least be at least we should be able to comment on if we are not showing it 
explicitly on another data set, we should be able to comment on particular scenarios where the method may not work, right? Let me give you an example. Many of our methods in deep neural networks is based on the assumption that the weight distributions are initialized from a normal curve, right? Okay, but as you recall, there is also a method that we proposed recently where if your distribution comes from normal as well as uniform distribution, it still works. Yeah. Okay. So this is something a referee can always ask because I mean, in neural networks, because everything is so random and it's stochastic in nature, right? Because neural networks are probabilistic in nature. So it might so happen that even if you initialize your weights from a normal distribution, when, when you are updating, your updated weights may not follow normal distributions. Right. Yeah. So what is true for one epoch may not be true for the next epochs. And which is where you have to say things like, OK, we are doing model averaging, so on and so forth. Right. OK. So the important point is the following is that, you know, in your paper, I mean, you cannot say that I propose something and this is the greatest invention of all times. Mm, that's right. Exactly exactly you, have to be, you have to be able to state that the method has limitations. And where do you anticipate those limitations? Where do they come from? Okay, so that is very, very important. If you don't, assuming that your paper has gone through, it was not rejected at the desk, right? It has gone through the reviewers. If you don't, the reviewers will insist that you do that, right? I mean, reviewers in good journals and conferences. Okay, all right, this slide I'll skip because this will get really technical, right? But if you go through this slide, you will know that a particular improvement on an existing model that we proposed, why is that an acceptable form of a hypothesis? Okay, all right, I, I, I'll skip this particular slide because this will become really technical. So the other thing that your, your paper in general needs to address is that what have you accomplished? You propose a method. I prove theorem one, theorem two, theorem three, a bunch of lemmas, all of that is fine, right? But when you are proving something, theoretically speaking, right? When you are proving something, you have to immediately, that proof has to immediately be followed by two or three lines of explanation saying what good this particular theoretical result is. Okay, all right. I can give you examples, I mean, if somebody wants, but let me, you know, hold that for a moment. So here again, I have listed out a bunch of achievements and impacts. And if you go to the fourth bullet point, you will see that we are also talking about creating a new data set. So sometimes that's also a very, very important contribution in your research. Did you probably create a data set of your own, right? Okay. And if you are in particular, if you are working in the theory of deep learning or deep learning in general, right? One of the active and hot questions, because this is an extremely difficult question to un answer, is that is your optimizer, the optimizer that you are proposing, whether the optimizer is a state of the art optimizer or not. And in order to claim that your optimizer is a state of the art optimizer, you need to have extensive empirical comparisons with everything else under the sun. You cannot leave one out. Okay. All right. So these are deliverables because see then, and then I have appeared in front of this uh, DST research committees many, many, many times after. And each and every time I went there, I mean, at first they're actually not interested in the scientific outcome of the research. The first question that they ask is that, where did you publish? And there, if you say, I have published in IEEE India some conference, or I have published in International Journal of something, Engineering, Science, Management, Economics, and Technology, something under the sun, right? There you will get a serious set. So the idea is to be able to publish in respectable places. And I'll tell you how to do that. I mean, once again, those are not magic tricks. Those are some standard good practices, but everything, uh, I mean, most of it, whether your paper will go through or not, will depend on the strength of your idea and implementation. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, now, I'm assuming, 
and I believe strongly that you are all very, very extremely smart guys. Meaning you can come up with strong theoretical ideas. You can come up with your own data sets, your own examples. You can apply your method to those data sets, get fantastic results. And you can, your, your methods will outperform everything else under the sun. All good, right? But then there is another aspect of research. I mean, you have several principal aspects of research that you need to know. For the first question is a journal search. Where do you search your journal? How do you search your journal? And whether your paper is good for a journal or whether your paper is good for a conference. Usually in computer science, what happens is conferences and journals are given equal weightage as long as your conferences are picked from, sorry, your conferences are picked from a very chosen list. Okay. All right. So let me show you a few of the other things which I op by opening a few tabs. So the first thing that I wanted to show you is this. Um, this one. Uh, have you heard of this core ranking portals? I'm assuming most of you are from computer science and information science, right? So have you heard of this core ranking? How many of you have heard of core ranking? Anyway. Fine. Let me tell you what core ranks are. So this is this is a conference portal, which is managed by Australian University, and so, right. So you can access the core conference database here. Do you see my screen, right? Everybody is able to see my screen, right? Maybe if you can zoom a little bit, it will be. Oh, it will, I will. This is a this is a web page. I see. This is a web page, right? So I cannot I control it. Visible. But is it is it okay? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is the core conference portal. Now, now one problem with core is they do not have a listing. So what you have to do is that let's say you don't know the name of a conference. Forget it. You don't know the name of the conference, but at least you know the area of your research, right? Okay. So let's just type in. computer networks. What do you see? Just let's just type in computer networks. I'll just I'll just okay. So what do you see? You see the titles, right? You see a bunch of conferences, right? You see their acronyms and you see their core rank. So this particular conference, the first row is not even ranked. It's a national conference. So a conf know this, any conference that only happens in one country and that country alone, and the organizers of the conference are not able to rotate the venue of the conference, then that conference will not be ranked in core. One classic example, Sanjay, you must be knowing this, right? I mean, during your time or maybe even after, HIPC used to be a very good conference. Yeah, yeah, computing. Conference. You look at H HIPC now, it is out of the core ranking. Yes. And the reason why HIPC no longer features on core ranking is that they have always organized the conference in India. Despite repeated requests from the core, asking them to at least once in two years or once in three years, move the conference out of India. They had the resources, they had the money, they never did it. Consequence, they no longer feature in, in the core ranking. Okay. So this conference, I typically conference on local computer networks. This is core ranked B. Okay. This is international symposium on networks, computer and communications. This is core ranked C. Similarly, if I just type machine learning, okay, you will see there are a bunch, bunch of conferences. Some of these conferences are ranked core A. Some of these conferences are ranked core A star. So what's the difference between core A and core A star and core B? Out of all the conferences listed on core, in fact, there are not many conferences listed on core. There are only 811 conferences that are listed on core. How many conferences do you think happens in India every year? Wild guess. One thousand, maybe. How many? No, roughly one thousand. <laughs> Sir, maybe more than five thousand. 
it's close to 10,000. Okay, so close to 10,000 conferences are being organized in India every year. Do you know how many of those conferences are in core? Five, only five. Only five of 10,000 conferences in India that happen every year are in the core list. And no conference from India is ranked core A. They are core B or core C. Okay. So core A star is about 7%, top 7% of those 800 plus conferences. Core A is about 15%. Core B is about 37%. Okay. So in prestige, core A star ranks highest, followed by core A, core B, and so on and so forth. Okay. So in computer science, and all of these core A, A star, and B conferences are both Scopus indexed as well as SCI. So if you are publishing in a core B conference, at least you can be rest assured that you are publishing in a Scopus index conference for sure. I mean, that's, I mean, that's in fact silly. If someone asks you after telling them that I have published in a core B conference, if they ask you if that conference is Scopus index, you should laugh at that person. Okay. All right. So this is this is how you search conferences. OK. All right. You if you even don't know the name of the conference, it's not a problem. It's not a problem at all. OK. Now, the next thing that I would wanted to I wanted to show you is how to find a journal. So Elsevier, Springer, IEEE transactions, SEM transactions, they all have their internal engine that will help you find a suitable journal from their existing journal database. So this is called the journal finder. This is a service from Elsevier. So what you do here, and I'll give you a demonstration. Let me, yes. Okay, so first what they would want is that they would want a title of your paper, right? So you type the title, okay. all right? Then they would like your abstract, okay? All right, so you copy the abstract. You copy the abstract and they would want some keywords. Okay, so you keep some keywords like deep learning, right? See, they will some most of the times, um, you know, neural, neural activation, you know, Bayesian analysis. Okay, enough. Okay, select field of study, study. You can just choose here. You can see you can you can come down, right? In engineering, you can just choose computer science and select field of research. You can sub field of research, I don't know, in computer science. Forget it. Even if you don't, it's okay. Okay. Now click on find journals. Do you see this? Do you see this screen? Everyone? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So find journals. So how are these journals sorted? These journals are sorted according to the site score or roughly impact factor and time to first decision. Okay. All right. You can apply, you can, if you want, you can apply more. Like you, if you want, uh, like for example, site score up to three. Time to first decisions, probably let's say 16 weeks, 15 weeks. Okay impact factor, let's say three, up to three. Time to publication, let's say 40 weeks. Okay, all right. Then there is only one journal that matches based on your title and abstract, computational statistics and data analysis. Okay. I mean, you can loosen or tighten, relax, or, you know, make the parameters more, I mean, stringent, or you relax it, right? And if you change this, let's say this, uh, change this, right, change that, right? Okay, this will autocorrect, and you will still see just one journal. Okay, all right. Okay, so I think probably if I increase this you get two journals now right and it's probably if i increase this whatever anyway 
right? So if you in increase this, you will see a bunch of journals popping up. Okay. And then you can go through all of these journals, look at their impact factors, and based on your confidence in, a, in your paper, you can choose a particular journal. So this is how you can choose a particular journal by using Elsevier service or Springer service or IEEE transaction or ACM transaction. Unfortunately, there is no unified service available at this point of time, right? So you have to individually go to the publisher web page and find this out. Okay. All right. So let me now go back to my talk. So journal search. And then the other thing that is very, very important nowadays because of UGC guidelines is that, for example, let's say I'll just take this. I'll copy this. I'll go to Symago JR. So this is a more scientific way to rank journals rather than ranking journals based on impact factors alone. Right. So I just type it here computational statistics and data analysis and what I Symago journal rank basically ranks all journals which are at least Scopus indexed into four quarters Q1, Q2, Q3 and Q4 right so you type in the name of a journal click enter right it will show you this right and then if you scroll down It will show you all different statistics and finally it will show you where exactly which quarter this particular journal belongs to it turns out it belongs to quarter one okay all right so this is another way of checking whether your journal belongs to either the intended journal this is this is only for journals though this is only for journals so this is to quick check whether your journal belongs to quarter one quarter two quarter three or four right what I can safely say that all the journals which are available on this particular database, all of these journals are at least Scopus indexed. That much I can say. Okay. Personally, what I think of Scopus, I think they are bogus. Right. But I, in my personal opinion, doesn't matter. Okay. Because UGC has a mandate saying that you need to publish in Scopus. So you publish in Scopus. I do think that SCI, which is Thomson Reuters, um, you know, journal impact factor uh, is much more prestigious than Scopus, right? But anyway, as I said, my opinion doesn't matter. Okay. I mean, in fact, the number of journals that you see on SCI database are actually half of the number of journals that you see on Scopus database. So their SCI is much more stringent and strict compared to Scopus. But anyway, okay. So, so then there is the other question. I mean, regarding you do research and then why would somebody care about your work in terms of acceptability? So as I mentioned this earlier, right? You have to propose if you are aiming for a transaction paper or a Q1 journal or even a Q2 journal, you have to propose a method. Without that, the paper will not go through. Absolutely not. In fact, it will be desk rejected. So here are some lessons. When your paper gets rejected, what do you do? You can curse the referee. Sure, you can do that. You can curse the editor of the journal. You can curse your luck. Mm -hmm. Then you can curse your neighbors. <laughs> and you can curse anyone and everyone, right? But when you settle down, right, think about why the rejection. Usually, a lot of papers get rejected at the desk itself. It does not even go to the referee, right? Gets rejected at the desk because of number of reasons. Number one, poor English, extremely poor English. I mean, it can be visible. And usually most of these journals these days, they use some algorithms, okay, to parse through your text. So they've identified the number of spelling mistakes, typos, bad English, right? And if that is greater than a particular threshold, the paper got automatically gets rejected. It does not even go to a human. Okay, so be careful. The other thing, is that it is very, very important to read and understand what the referee is saying. See, most very likely the referee doesn't know you and therefore does not have a personal animos animosity against you. He is not your friend, he's not your enemy, right? So it's an interpersonal, I mean, it's actually an impersonal thing, right? So take that review in your stride, read the review, and try to critically analyze the review. 
sometimes the referees could be unreasonable it happens to me it happens to everyone right but most of the times they actually give very good comments if the journal or the conference is good and it is actually the referee the peer review the concept of peer review originated from the idea that a peer of mine would give me a constructive comment and that will only help improve the quality of my work most referees still believe in that and their job is not to torture you or put your life to misery okay so take most of the comments at the face value and try to improve your paper okay if the referee is saying something which is not reasonable you have the option for redressal which i'm going to show you as well right and it is also important to read papers with reviews so i'll show you another website okay this website is known as openreview.net. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. So this is known as openreview.net. Let me amplify this further. Okay. So in openreview.net, there is a bunch of conferences. If you can click on past conferences, you can go to papers, click on any of the papers. And if you click on any of the paper like this one, what you will see is that you will see the abstract of the paper you will be able to download the PDF for free. And what is most important, you scroll down, you will see the comments of the referees, not only the comments of the referees, but the response of the authors to the comments of the referees. Okay, so most of these, because I am a reviewer for this conference, and I particularly chose this paper because one of the reviewers is me, I'm not going to tell you who because most of these reviewers are anonymized. So Okay, so you wouldn't know, you wouldn't actually, you wouldn't actually see who the referee is, right? But you will be able to see the comments and you'll be able to see how the authors have responded to those comments and whether the response is satisfactory. Okay, so it's important that you go through this. Inter so this is the forum that I was talking about a little earlier, right? There has to be an informal discussion forum where you discuss with people and try to learn something from your peers. That's how people get smarter, right? Because remember one day, no matter how smart you are, there is always one person in this world who is smarter than you. Okay. Is there a question? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. So it is, you have uh, the reviews for as well as journals. This is only for conferences because journals have not journals have not adopted this culture yet. Okay. So most of the core A star conferences like NIPS, ICML, ICLR, AAAI, COLT, I mean UAI, all of these top conferences have adopted this culture. That so uh, let, let me tell you. So when I review one particular paper, okay, the moment I review and post, right, my comments are visible to the authors, not only to the authors, it has, it is actually visible to everyone else on the web. So this particular system makes referees more accountable because if I'm a stupid referee, right, and I write something, you know, ridiculous, I mean, it will be known immediately, right? Yeah. Okay. True. But this is this is a good culture. This is a resource for you that you can really use to a very good effect, right? Okay. And you can see how elaborate the referee comments are and how elaborate the author responses are. So in this connection, I would like to show you another, this is mine, right? This is the response to an IEEE transaction paper. Okay. I hope you can see this, right? I'll go to the first page. You can look at the top marker, right? How many pages do you see? 12, right? Ten. You see 12 pages. This is not a paper. This is only our response to the referee questions. So this is as this is that intense it can get. It, it should, and I'm sure all of you will reach to this level someday. But you have to practice this. So I'll tell you this: whenever I share, whenever a new student comes and works with me, I not only share papers with him or her to read, I also share these documents so that. It is important. So you see in bold, in bold are the referee questions. Okay. All right. And followed by our responses. Pretty elaborate responses, right? We have to do this. Otherwise, you cannot satisfy a referee. 
So this is also part of a good research culture that you prepare a response file and you try to articulate as clearly as possible. Okay. All right. Okay. So let me go back to my talk. So yeah, I am, I'm pretty close to being done. Yeah. And then the one thing that I hate, so which is why I wrote this, you know, you actually, whenever you think you are, you are hand waving or whenever you think somebody else is hand waving, you place a not get before that, you know, not gets right in digital logic, you know what they do, right? So in general, these things are important. Your hypothesis is important, but your hypothesis should sound credible. You cannot say your yoga, yoga create cures cancer. That's stupid. No, but no, no, no respectable journal will actually accept it. Okay. Then your hypothesis has to be supported by, okay, in order to support this hypothesis, we have to make certain contributions in methods, and then we make certain claims. Then there has to be a proof of concept of the hypothesis in theory, as well as through extensive empirical experiments. The empirics has to be really, really strong, right? Okay. And if you are designing an experiment, you have to be really, really careful about the control trial group. I mean, when you are designing the cause and effect scenario, for example, and you pick two groups, you have to be really careful how you are picking those groups. Diversity is very, very important when you are picking groups, right? When you do a sampling experiment, diversity and representativeness has to be extremely important. You cannot pick a sample of weights which range in the 55 to 60 gauges. That's not diverse enough. That's not inclusive, inclusive enough. But these are some of the things that you have to be really, really careful on the empiric side. Now, when you design and test, there are a bunch of things. These are some of the standard things that I have just listed out for you, right? So when you do design and test, let's say you are proposing a state of the art optimizer at a swarm. The question is, how are you benchmarking? You have to benchmark against all existing state of the art. So that means you have to be at least aware of the state of the art literature. So as far as Adaswam is concerned, we had to compare with Adam, we had to compare with gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent with momentum, Ada delta, Ada grad, AMS grad, so on and so forth. So it doesn't matter if your tables get really large or it doesn't really matter how many tables you have to incorporate in your paper, you have to do it anyway. Okay, now for a particular problem, what are your benchmark data? There are plenty of places on the web like Stanford's repository, University of California, Irving's repository, plenty of data as far as classification is concerned, both on the optimization side as well as the classification side, computer vision, non-computer vision, regression, everywhere. You have to be as extensive as possible, right? Then what are your benchmarks? Time to converge, accuracy, F1 score, loss, and what kind of loss you are taking, you try to actually benchmark it on all possible kinds of losses, at least the ones which are popular in literature, like mean absolute error, mean square error, binary cross entropy. What is the complexity of your algorithm, at least empirically? How much you wrote a method? What is the GPU utilization? What is your carbon footprint? How many epochs is your algorithm taking to converge? All of these are benchmarks that you have to actually compare with all of the other state of the art optimizers. Just accuracy is not good enough. And also, always when you do benchmarking comparison, you have to do this. Let's say you know that, that usually for a particular data set, the threshold error is 0.01. So you set a threshold error and you compare two methods, right? You compare both methods until they hit that threshold error. And then what are you comparing? You're comparing the epochs both of these methods take to reach that threshold error. So that is set one. What is set two? You actually set a number of threshold epochs. You say that, okay, I'm not going to waste more than 500 epochs. So let me see whether method one in 500 epochs, what kind of error it does get down to and method two, what kind of error it does get down. So both of these are equally important, okay? And there are some classic mistakes that people make, um, wrong statistical assumptions. Uh, people think that correlation is causation. Like if two features are strongly correlated, it does not mean that one feature is influencing the other feature. It just means that they are strongly correlated, that's all. There is some, in, some dependence between the two, okay? All right, 
I have seen outrageous claims being made out of that correlation, Pearson correlation coefficient or whatever. Okay, so causality is a completely different ball game. Unless you are not sure, don't even go there. Okay, your research outcome must be a lot more reliable than coin toss. What do I mean? I mean that when you run an experiment and you report some benchmarks, you cannot do it just once and report. You have to do it multiple times and take a statistical average. You have to take the mean of your performance and the standard deviation from your average performance. So if the standard deviation is too much, that means your method is not reliable. Okay. All right. Okay. So some of the important tools. Now the question is, how do you prepare yourself for research? Your background training is very important. I mean, you have to really refresh your previous skills like data structures, algorithms, uh, particularly algorithms, data structures, discrete mathematical structures, graph theory. These are some of the tools that you require for research. You have to be good at it. So if you have forgotten or not feeling confident about it, it's time that you revisit those. And this is why I think your coursework is extremely important. And I keep telling my PhD students, right, all the time that you have to take your coursework extremely seriously and do well, because that forms the foundation of it. Most of the people that I have seen, particularly in Bangalore, they take coursework just because they have to pass. That's a bad strategy. And that is where you are actually, you know, hitting yourself in the ankle. Okay. You are shooting yourself in the toe. Don't do that. Okay. Particularly, there is one particular course in that VTU offers, which is research methodology. I don't care how the questions are being framed, but the content of the course is really good. Take that course seriously. Not only does it prepare you for research methodology, it also exposes you to some of the very important statistical tools that you will also use later in your research. Okay. And there is absolutely, absolutely no way that you can avoid statistics. Absolutely. You have to be statistics literate in the sense that whenever you see data and some graphs, you can actually come up with a reasonable interpretation. Okay. All right. And finally, if you are able to make your marriage work, you, you should be able to make your PhD work as well. All right. Okay. I gratefully acknowledge Jayant because we have been working for a very, very long time and for the continuous and stimulating discussions that also helped me prepare the slides and my present and former PhD students from whom I had learned a lot. Okay. And of course, the number of online images and cartoons that you have seen in the slides are actually taken from the internet. Okay. So thank you very much. I would like to stop here and I would like to take your questions. Question. Uh, audience may ask them. I hope I didn't scare you, but as I said, I would be, I would be really, I have to be honest when I talk about this kind of a this kind of a topic so if you have questions regarding conferences i think i have shown um, a few information sources which you can use now all of those are free so which you can use to you know then that should help you um, accelerate your research uh, I think I was wondering uh, while uh, your presentation was on, this uh, journal finder website, sometimes uh, it just doesn't reflect uh, the right set of journals. I mean, it just doesn't. I know, that's, just that's a so. chance. That's a chance that we have to, because most of these, um, most the, the, the algorithm that these journals use are actually based on exact keyword extraction. So if they are not able to do that, it throws off the results, okay? Uh, because they don't even they don't even search for the keywords. I mean, they don't even search for the synonyms of the keywords. They actually search for the exact keywords which are stored in their databases. 
so typically when you paste your abstract what they do is they do a they run a keyword extraction algorithm okay they so to extract the keywords and then th those keywords that they extract from your abstract needs to match with the keywords stored in their database right right but so suppose it's a, it's a start it's a start i mean yeah. it's a, it's a good tool okay to begin to with start. yeah as you suppose because if i have an abstract i want to know which would be should be sending my manuscript so if a journal finder doesn't give then ideally the uh, most or uh, what do you suggest i i i mean i think saimeg uh, journal and country ranking portal then you have to manually look out for the yeah, journal that is that yeah that is see saimeg is only useful when you already know a set of journals right that you plan your articles to but since some, let's say when i started this when i was a novice right okay i mean at least in machine learning i had to do this right i had to rely on the journal recommender journal finder journal recommender the journal the springer system is known as journal suggester and elsevier is journal finder okay mm -hmm. okay and i triple and acm transactions have their own engines internal engines built in as but for someone who doesn't have any clue as to where to submit this is a good start yeah true but in order to make the journal work this kind of a process work your abstract needs to be well written if your abstract yeah, is right. all over the place this this kind of a tool won't help hey hanshu i am going call yes please yes. i go uh, yeah you are you are searching for computer networks no and I, yeah. com or nsdib why is it so these are the best conferences in network computer networks you mean in the core you mean yeah core a plus it should be a core a plus conferences i mean if 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 they cannot be found if they are not found under computer networks they probably would be found somewhere else like for example i mean lot of the computer network conferences also pop up under communications right so um, you know i mean it, this will i think this is a much more comprehensive list in you see a bunch of a star a, a, a conference you know what uh, govind lot of the top conferences even last year because core is now changing every year lot of the conferences which were core a or core a star have been downgraded to b and some of these conferences are actually chucked out of core like i will give you one example jcdl journal uh, the joint conference on digital libraries which is a very good conference for nlp does and that was a core a star conference last year does not feature in core anymore this year they actually completely if you, without actually, actually if you look at systems research uh, prestigious yeah. places where uh, works are published are in conferences rather than journals if you look at operating yes, systems computer architecture of course of course yes 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 operating systems compilers automated theory yeah yeah, uh, yeah. formal 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 verification most of these areas i mean the track a computer science you mean right the track yeah. a computer science people prefer conference that, but machine learning artificial intelligence the conferences or journals are have equal weightage i mean they i mean they really don't matter much right but uh, that, uh, that is not being taken into consideration if you look at some of if you look at the iits they might they might accept a conference paper but if you look at ha ah, that is once again that is once again you are taking me on a slippery slope because this is something that you need to take it up with your management right i mean okay. <laughs> here 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 in bets pilani the conferences and journals are given equal weightage as long as the conferences are core a and core a star okay 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 no not okay, core, b. core b conferences so there is a weightage here so i think a good strategy evaluation strategy is the following i think so this is my opinion this is not my institutional opinion that you publish one journal like a q1 or q2 right or you publish one core a or core a star conference okay or you publish two core b conferences a year this is what i think is a fair evaluation so i mean i'm i am willing to give equal weightage to journals if your conference publication is either a core a or a core a star and i think sometimes core a star conferences are better than journals right i mean i mean but transactions will come pretty close 
we know that, right? I mean, transactions are a different class altogether. But a lot of these core star conferences are much better than the Springer and Elsevier journals. I give you that. Okay. In fact, I think that if you publish in core A star or NA conferences, the visibility of you and your institution is much more rapid compared to a journal publication. It gives you more, more, more visibility. It gives you a lot more attention. Okay. Audience has uh, more questions to ask mm -hmm. the professors. Yeah, I got one question. Uh, it is yes, a very good please. presentation, same sir. And uh, um, this one now we are publishing a lot of papers in, in Indian or uh, uh, international journals. How the publishing in IEEE transaction, whatever it may be. How much percentage of that one converted into uh, patents? That is the one thing. Second one is, in the case of machine learning and deep learning, the data preparation is very important. Because you mentioned somewhere in the slide, people are taking a lot of data from UCI. Maybe it may be good. But preparing the data for our algorithm, it will take a lot of effort, rather than applying some algorithm on that. What is your view on that? The first question is, uh, if I go by the statistics of our institution, I can, I don't know the nationwide statistics. I think about uh, five to seven percent of uh, all our top publications from Bits Pilani go into patenting. Some part of it, five to seven percent, not more than that, which is which is okay because in academic institutions i don't believe that patenting is a very good idea i mean if you patent each and everything like for just imagine patenting newton's laws of motion or patenting you know fourier transform right i mean patenting limits the usage so since we are in academia i think if about i think i would think that about 10 percent of your ideas get converted to patents that's good because People also think, because see, patenting, where it came from, it actually came from the pharmaceutical companies, the giant pharmaceutical companies. For them, patenting makes sense because it protects them. In academia, you only need to protect your idea till you publish. Once you publish, you would actually want idea that idea to be freely shared among your peers so that they can take it further forward. And that's how science progresses. And that's how science progressed in the last 400 years. I agree with that. Patenting is right. not a sole so, and whole of our uh, yeah, so, the papers. So, yeah. yeah. So the first part of your question. The second part of your question was, what was the second question? Pardon me. What was the second question? Uh, uh, second question is uh, data preparation. Right. So data preparation, a lot of the times, I'll tell you, I'll give you examples. Like, for example, in natural language processing, right? Particularly in India, because, I mean, there is, I mean, a lot of other countries cannot do this. Because in India, there are so many languages and dialects, right? So preparing a good data set is a, is a, is a really good contribution. And you can do that if you are doing natural language processing. Like I know people who had uh, prepared data sets from scratch in, for Hindi, Devanagari, Odia, uh, you know, Tamil, you know, Kannada, you know, some you know, Naga, Khasi languages, some of the local languages that even Adivasi speak, right? So some... A lot of the times it makes sense, okay? A lot of the times in machine learning, the data, if it comes from the industry, like for example, if you are getting an oil rig data that comes from the industry, right? These are the kind of data that you cannot prepare. This is the kind of data that you have to, you know, get it from the authorized source. Healthcare data. Sometimes if you tie up with hospitals, you can prepare healthcare data, right? But there also you have to be really, really careful while sharing the data because there are very extremely strict laws like HIPAA in North America and Europe and everywhere, right? Yeah, so privacy, they, privacy, they privacy is a HIPAA standard thing. in the US. And right, right. So, I mean, it depends, right? Sometimes in my work, I don't bother about um, preparing data much, right? Because it's my work is mostly developing theory on machine learning. 
So yeah, I, I data preparation. Like what I mean to say that data preparation take more time on uh, compared to the actual publishing or uh, doing some apprentice. It might. Or... It might. Yes. Yes. It might. You are right. You are right. But uh, if you are asking based on the strength of that alone, that we have prepared data, you are you are presenting a new data set. Uh, based on that, top conferences and journals won't accept your paper. Okay. However. There are some sources where you can freely host your data and then you can ask people to cite that data set. So that way, if people host, people are using or reusing your data, they cite you. In that year, that a lot of people do that. Okay. By the way, I have forgotten to tell you one important source where you can actually use and reuse a lot of your codes is GitHub. Mm. Okay. So you, you should go to, I mean, GitHub and see other people's codes and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Uh, I think if and then we can uh, wind this down. And uh, I would like to Dr. Saha, and uh, over to Sanjay sir. Uh, wanted to have a question in the group, uh, if that allows me. Yeah. Anyway, if anyone has a question, um, yeah. You know, even after my talk, he or she can email me, and that's okay. Sure, I'll I'll share your mail ID with the with the audience. Mm -hmm. Maybe in yeah. But I was wondering if uh, please share the slides, sir. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I I have already shared my slides with your HOD. Sure. Okay. And yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'll connect with uh, otherwise not there then probably we'll have to right? in the meantime if there are any questions they can uh, we just go ahead Okay, I think it's probably either I have scared them, scared most of them. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the last word from me, uh, it is an excellent yeah. presentation, Sam Chu. We have gone Thank through you. a lot of presentation, where your presentation is, makes a difference. That I can Thank say. You. Thank yes, you. Sir. Yes, sir. I think I personally feel it is a very excellent presentation. I would certainly follow for the exponential average. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, as long as it helps, I'm, I'm happy if it helps. That's uh, I think I'm not. Yes, sir. So we will uh, wrap it. So, Professor Saha, uh, it was a very interesting session. And each one of us would have got a lot of uh, information about it. I knew it most of the things anyway. But again, it was... Uh, it was well, I mean, you cannot be you cannot be too sure. Don't think that you know everything, right? I mean, so it's like, I mean, uh, some of the things actually, uh, to be fair with you, Achana, some of the things actually, I discovered or rediscovered while preparing for this talk. I mean, I was not so, aware of this over uh, this review part. I wasn't aware. Ah, yeah. right. I mean, that even I, I mean, aware, see, yeah. these are these are these are actually this is actually a new development. This open review stuff has become popular in the last one and a half years. It was not there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, lot of infighting and acrimony had went on between big people and some papers got rejected. Some papers got unfairly rejected. So people started writing it on social media, saying yeah. that, okay, look. So like, in fact, what happened was one of our papers got rejected last year in AAAI. A few months back, the same paper gets through to a very prestigious IEEE transactions, right? Yeah. So what I did, I went to Twitter. I tweeted. Yeah, right? sure. I tweeted. I tweeted tagging the conference organizers. Right. So these things have an impact. So they just, I think what this does is that it makes the review process more transparent. Right. 
But at the same time, for anybody who is starting research, this is an excellent resource. Yeah. An excellent resource for free. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, actually, there's uh, anyway, there are some places also, maybe, like Sci Hub and. Yeah, Sci Hub. Sci Hub is unstable in the sense because they keep on changing their mirrors, right? Because yeah. they are being constantly hounded by the police and the some countries like North America and Europe, particularly elsewhere, and Springer are after them. So if yeah. you if you see, they keep on changing the mirrors. Yeah. Like sometimes they'll be mirroring from Tanzania, sometimes they'll be mirroring from Slovakia and all those places, right? Yeah. So so sometimes that so the database is not consistent. They had to temporarily remove some papers, but it's once again a very good, uh, very good resource. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think with that we will wrap up. I want to thank you on behalf of the Department of International Science. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it was such a pleasure to, to hear you today. And I think I will wrap this session up and I'll say goodbye to everybody. So maybe I'll connect with you, Dr. Saha, after this meeting. Oh, sh shall, I, shall I stay back in this meeting link? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, and this is here. Okay, okay. So uh, I request all the others to drop off from the meeting. Yeah, I'll also just I'll just come back in a minute. I'll just get my coffee. Thank you. Thank you. But that's all. That's all. Others can leave the meeting. So I'm manually reviewing the meeting if they are not moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I think probably I'll just stop sharing and then I restart the sharing so that okay. Recording at this point of time. Ah, recording. You are not recording me, right? Not anymore. <laughs> One minute. Because I'm going to say some.